<laughs> Good afternoon and welcome back, back to, uh, for the part two of the City Council Transportation Committee's hearing on the fiscal 2019 preliminary budget and the fiscal 2018 preliminary mayor management report. My name is Idanis Rodriguez and I have the privilege of chairing this committee. Early this morning, the committee heard testimony from the Metropolitan Transit Authority. This afternoon, we will hear from the Department of Transportation, DOT. Today, we are joined by the subcommittee on capital budget, chaired by Council Member Vanessa Gibson. The DOT preliminary expense budget for fiscal 2019 is approximately $965.2 million. In addition, $8.8 .8 billion is budget in fiscal 2019 for the department's capital program. We look forward to the commissioner uh, updating this committee on the department's effort to maintain and improve the city's roadway infrastructure, improve pedestrian safety, and the implementation of the Vision Zero Action Plan. Additionally, we hope the department will discuss its four-year capital plan, particularly in terms of its goal and priorities for the next four years, the scope and the progression of work on the East River bridges and the reconstruction of the pedestrian ramps and the roadways citywide, the reconstruction of the BQE cantilever and the ongoing installation of the traffic safety bollers around the city. While overall bus ridership has declined, select bus services ridership has increased. Select bus services has the ability to make transportation in the city more equitable, accessible, and reliable for New Yorkers, particularly those living in neighborhoods underserved by the subways. The committee anticipates receiving an update date on the current status of select bus services and the agency's plans for expansion. Additionally, as average bus speed have fallen, we hope to hear about the department's plans for transit signal priority installation, as well as additional bus lane camera enforcement to ensure that SBS buses move quickly and efficiently. We need to have a bus action plan. Finally, last fall, the administration released a series of initiatives with the hope of reducing congestion in Manhattan Central Business District. The committee would like to hear an update on these initiatives, which include restricting parking, streamlining curbside, side deliveries, and increasing block the box enforcement. Before we, before we hear from the, the, the commissioner, let me take a moment to recognize my colleagues on the committee on the transportation who have joined us this morning. Uh, Council Member Vanessa Gibson, uh, Chairman of the, of the Capital Committee, uh, Con Council Member Constantinides, Rodential, Van Bremer, Powers, Lander, and Dodge. Uh, Mario, sorry. Let's hear from the co-chairman, the, the, the chairman of the committee of capital, and then we start with the DOT commission. Thank you so much to Chair Rodriguez. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's great to be here. I am Councilmember Vanessa Gibson of the 16th District in the Bronx, and I am so proud to be here in serving in a new capacity as the Chair of the Subcommittee on Capital Budget. I first and foremost want to thank our Speaker, Corey Johnson, for the incredible uh, leadership and certainly for appointing me to chair this new subcommittee on capital budget. I look forward to not only today's conversation, but certainly um, for the remainder of this month and having extremely important conversations with all of our agency heads as it relates to the capital budget. I want to thank my co-chair, Chair Idanis Rodriguez, for chairing this important hearing with me today. 
And certainly, I want to highlight the City Council's renewed focus on the city's capital program, which for far too long has truly not received the same level of attention and priority as the expense and revenue portions of our overall budget. The Department of Transportation's FY 2019 preliminary capital budget includes $8.8 billion in FY 2 2019 through FY 2022. This represents approximately 19% of the city's total $45.9 billion capital budget for 2019 through 2022 and is in addition to the $7.6 billion that has already been appropriated in fiscal 2018. Although this means that the department has the authority to spend $16.4 billion between fiscal 2018 and fiscal 2022, the agency's plan commitments as set forth in the commitment plan total only $13.3 billion. The department's commitment rate is extremely good, and I want to commend DOT for that when you compare it to the city as a whole. Between fiscal 2014 and fiscal 2017, the department committed 68% of its projects on schedule, compared to the citywide average of 56%. So we certainly look forward to hearing testimony this afternoon about the agency's best practices and best measures and learning how other agencies may be able to emulate some of DOT's work in order to bring up their own commitment rates. Like many agencies in this city, however, DOT's budget makes use of overly broad budget lines to cover a wide variety of projects within each of those lines. While, each, while this gives the agency the flexibility that is needed to complete the individual projects within the lines, it greatly reduces the City Council's ability to hold meaningful oversight to ensure accountability. Before I turn back to Chair Rodriguez, I also want to make mention of an urgent capital issue that is pending before the state legislature, which would have a great and positive impact on DOT's capital plan in particular. The state must authorize the city to use design build for the Brooklyn Queens Expressway repair project. If anyone drives in our city and drives on the BQE, you know that the BQE is in need of attention. Design build has the ability to expedite the capital work that DOT needs to do in order to increase the productivity and the longevity of the BQE. And certainly, DOT has been leading the conversation and had a press conference a few weeks ago, and we do not want to revert any truck traffic onto our local streets off of the BQE. Um, that would be a disservice to New Yorkers and certainly to the neighboring communities that abut the BQE. So our commissioner has estimated that design build authority from the state would save $158 million and two years of construction time on this project alone. The state has granted itself this authority to complete major transportation projects, such as the Tappan Zee Bridge, the Kosciuszko Bridge, both of which were completed on time and on budget at a significantly reduced price than had been then they would have been if they used the a traditional design bid build model there's absolutely no good reason why the city should not also benefit from design build so i certainly want to urge all of our colleagues to join our speaker in calling upon the state and our colleagues in albany to prevent the needless waste of city taxpayer dollars and pass this authorization as quickly as possible so we can authorize design build in the city of New York. I want to thank the members of our subcommittee um, who are here with us, our minority leader, Council Member Steve Matteo, Council Member Keith Powers, and Council Member Barry Gredenchik, who have joined us. I want to thank them, and certainly to the finance team, I always want to recognize for their hard work, Latanya McKinney, our director, Regina Pareda Ryan, our deputy director, our deputy director, Nathan Toll, and Paul Simone, our financial analyst, John Basil, and our unit head, Chima
O.B. Cherry. And I want to thank Chair Rodriguez once again, and I look forward to today's testimony and certainly our conversations that will continue after today's hearing. Thank you once again, Chair Rodriguez. Thank you, Chairman and, and Chairwoman. And I also like to acknowledge Councilman McCoo, who is here, and Commissioner Happy International Women's Day to you and everyone here. Thank you for everything that you do in leadership at, at DOT, and especially also thank you for Vision Zero right now taking the lead with you and your team on the Car Free Day that will take place Saturday 21st, uh, the day before Earth Day. With that, now ask the committee council to administer the oath. Please raise your right hand. Do you firm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Thank you. Okay. Yes, thank you. H Happy National Women's Day to our, our uh, women colleagues up on the dais as well. Good afternoon, Chairman Rodriguez and Chairwoman Gibson and members of the Transportation Committee and the Subcommittee on Capital Budget. I'm Polly Trottenberg, Commissioner of the New York City Department of Transportation, and with me today are Elizabeth Franklin, Associate Commissioner for Budget and Capital Program Management, and Rebecca Zack, Assistant Commissioner for Intergovernmental and Community Affairs. We're pleased to be here today on behalf of Mayor Bill de Blasio to testify on DOT's fiscal, fiscal year 2019 preliminary expense budget and capital plan. We're also very happy to be testifying today before the Council's new subcommittee on the capital budget. I will attempt today, my testimony is long, so I will attempt to summarize in a couple of places the written testimony you have in front of me. The proposed budget will support DOT in its mission to provide for the safe, efficient, and environmentally sustainable movement of people and goods in New York City and maintain and enhance the transportation infrastructure crucial to our economic vitality and the quality of life of our customers, city residents, commuters, and visitants. The budget also comes at a time when we're responding to a number of major transportation challenges facing our city. First, our continued work on Vision Zero. I want to start by acknowledging this week's tragic crash in Park Slope in which we lost two young children and three others were injured. We're all mourning this heartbreaking loss and, and we will be taking action. I've directed my planning and engineering experts to analyze and redesign the 9th Street Corridor, including protected bike lanes and other pedestrian safety treatments. We're going to have a more detailed plan to unveil in the next few weeks. We will then present our plan to local residents, businesses, elected officials, and the community board next month to gather valuable input and plan to implement as soon as the weather permits. At the same time, the mayor has promised to roll out a set of legislative proposals to address the legal loopholes that allow deadly drivers to remain on New York's roads. This terrible crash is a reminder that even after four straight years of declining roadway fatalities under Vision Zero and the great work that we have done with the council and other partners, our work is far from done. Today I will also discuss the impending L train tunnel closure, now a little over a year away, tackling increased congestion as our city experiences record growth, and how DOT and New York City Transit can work together to improve bus service and reverse the trend of declining bus ridership. And I will discuss some of our major capital challenges, including the need to reconstruct the BQE Expressway, as the chair chairwoman has mentioned, and do all this while operating and maintaining the vast roadway and bridge network which New Yorkers rely on every day. In our FY18 to 22 capital budget, the mayor commits to historic investments in infrastructure with a focus on Vision Zero and state of good repair. DOT has dramatically increased the size of our capital program, and we're proud that we've doubled the rate at which we initiate construction. And we continue to improve our delivery of capital projects to save time and taxpayer dollars. You have in front of you the written breakdown of our capital plan, our $13.3 billion for bridge reconstruction, street reconstruction, sidewalks and pedestrian ramps, the Staten Island ferries, street lights and signals, and facilities and equipment needed to support our operations. You also have before you the breakdown of our preliminary financial plan for $965 million for traffic operations, roadway maintenance, our DOT operations, bridge maintenance and inspection, transportation planning and management, and ferry operations and maintenance. I will now take a minute to walk through some of the challenges I mentioned. Thanks to our partnership with the NYPD, our sister agencies, as well as the council, as you all know, traffic deaths have declined by 27% in the last four years, with pedestrian fatalities down 44%. And New York City's bucked the national trend, where fatalities have increased 15% over the same time period. However, as we saw with the tragic crash this week in Park Slope, more remains to be done. 
217 people lost their lives in vehicle crashes last year and we're committed to continuing the aggressive pace of our safety work under Vision Zero. DOT's proposed Vision Zero capital budget is 1.5 billion in fiscal years 18 to 22, including 57.5 million in new approved funding in this January plan. The expense budget contains nearly 270 million over that same time period. This past year, we completed a record 114 safety improvement projects, up 138% over the pre-Vision Zero five-year average, installed nearly 25 miles of protected bike lanes, implemented left turn calming treatments at 110 intersections, and installed 832 pedestrian head start signal timings. With the release of our safer cycling report in July of 2017, DOT is committed to building 75 bike lane miles in 10 priority bicycle districts by 2022. These areas represent neighborhoods in Brooklyn and Queens outside of the city central core, such as Bed-Stuy, East New York, Sheepshead Bay, Jackson Heights, Elmhurst, and Ridgewood where we're seeing that fully 25% of the city's serious bicycle crashes are concentrated. And as part of our overall strategic plan, we'll continue to implement at least 50 miles of bike lanes a year citywide, including at least 10 protected miles. On the capital side, we have a number of exciting projects moving forward, explained in more detail in my testimony, but downtown Far Rockaway, more work on the Brooklyn Waterway Green Front, the second phase of the reconstruction of Tillery Street, and our Great Streets Works continues on Atlantic Avenue, Grand Concourse, Brooklyn's Fourth Avenue, now with a protected bike lane in the redesign, and of course, Queens Boulevard, where we've now seen three years without a cyclist or pedestrian fatality. The comprehensive overhauls of these four critical corridors, once known for their sky-high rates of pedestrian injuries and fatalities, have allowed us to do more than make permanent safety enhancements. The changes have brought and will bring livable, vibrant green and high-quality streets to underserved neighborhoods, an invaluable contribution to the long-term culture change needed to support Vision Zero. Lastly, on the topic of Vision Zero, I want to remind the Council that the state authorization for our life-saving speed camera program expires on July 25th of this year. Since this program began over four years ago, it has reduced speeding violations by an average of 63% where cameras are deployed. The city is working to hard to advocate for reauthorization and expansion of this vital program this session up in Albany. Last year, the Council sent a strong signal of support with a home rule message, and we ask for your help and support again this year. Speed cameras have saved lives, and this law must not be allowed to lapse. As you know, starting in April of next year, 275,000 daily L-Train customers and hundreds of thousands of other commuters will be deeply affected by the 15-month closure of the L-Line from 8th Avenue in Manhattan to Bedford Ave in Brooklyn. As you may recall from the testimony I offered here at the Council in December with MTA Managing Director Ronnie Hakem, DOT has been working closely with our partners at New York City Transit. We've proposed an aggressive menu of travel options, including increased subway service, alternative buses that will use bus priority lanes, and HOV restrictions on the Williamsburg Bridge. All of this will be complemented by protected bicycle lanes in Brooklyn and Manhattan, and a new ferry route connecting the two boroughs. At our presentation in December, we laid out detailed proposals for a busway on 14th Street and a protected two-way bike lane on 13th Street in Manhattan. Since then, at the request of the speaker and other elected officials representing affected Manhattan neighborhoods, we've publicly provided the traffic analyses that undergirded those plans. We've also now announced our proposed plans for protected bike lanes on Grand Street in Williamsburg, which will allow local deliveries and keep buses moving to and from the Williamsburg Bridge by effectively preventing Grand's use by through traffic. DOT and New York City Transit have also continued an extensive and spirited public outreach campaign. Our open houses in Manhattan and Brooklyn, attended by nearly 1,000 people, have been supplemented by dozens of smaller stakeholder meetings with elected officials, local residents, businesses, and major institutions. New York City Transit President Andy Byford and I have spoken to a lot of very passionate people who both support and oppose our proposed mitigation plans. We're taking everything we've heard into account and in the weeks ahead plan to host more town hall events before we present the next set of refinements to our plan. Let me now turn to congestion. As you know, the city with its thriving economy has attracted more visitors, workers, and residents than ever before. Since 1990, we've added 1.2 million people to our population, the equivalent of a city nearly the size of Dallas. Our subway streets, sidewalks, and crosswalks are busier than ever, and construction and increased deliveries have added even more to the mix. It's also now quite clear that the rapid growth of the for hire vehicle industry has contributed to congestion, particularly in the Manhattan core. And in all boroughs except Manhattan, the number of registered passenger vehicles has risen faster than the rate of population growth. 
We've heard loud and clear from community boards, elected officials, business, motorists, bus riders, and pedestrians that New Yorkers are frustrated by congestion and its impact on their daily lives. For the city's part, DOT has moved forward with the mayor's congestion plan announced last October using the tools at our disposal to aggressively address key congestion hotspots. Earlier this week, NYP NYPD Transportation Chief Thomas Chan and I announced installation of new don't block the box markings and signage at 50 targeted intersections with aggressive enforcement by NYPD. Later this month, we'll be rolling out new clear curb delivery restrictions on two key corridors, Flatbush Ave in Brooklyn and Roosevelt Ave in Queens, restricting curbside parking and loading on both sides of the street during peak morning and evening hours. Subsequently in Midtown Manhattan, similar restrictions during peak morning and evening hours will go into effect in a zone from 6th to Madison Ave and from 45th to 50th Streets. In addition, we'll streamline curb regulations to allow loading on only one side of the street from 7 to 7 on weekdays on 11 crosstown streets, along with new turn lanes and intersections. Turning to Albany, we welcome the robust discussion that has grown out of Governor Cuomo's Commission on Congestion, including a focus on commercial and for hire vehicles. And the mayor has expressed some openness to the latest set of congestion proposals. The mayor has said, though, that any congestion pricing plan that charges New Yorkers must prioritize the needs of the New York City subway and bus system. This includes a requirement that all the proceeds are invested in mass transit and a mechanism for real input by the city of New York on transit products and priorities, and not just a nuclear option veto at the end of the process. The mayor has also said that any pricing scheme for passenger vehicles must take the needs of those who are low income and those with disabilities into account. I have been to both London and Stockholm and talked to those city's experts who successfully implemented their pricing systems. Should the legislature pass some form of congestion pricing, DOT will diligently implement whatever is enacted. <laughs> In addition, the mayor has urged the legislature to consider expediting a surcharge on for hire vehicles and taxis, as long as it's done in an industry-wide equitable way. Going back quickly to the subject of block the box, I also want to note that we were especially encouraged by the inclusion of new automated enforcement of block the box in Manhattan among the governor's 30-day budget amendments last month. This would empower New York City to tackle and further expand enforcement of a violation that contributes to gridlock. In addition, the city would also strongly support receiving broad authorization for the use of bus lane cameras in the proposed congestion zone south of 60th Street in Manhattan. As members of this committee and others have said, speeding up buses in the Midtown core is an important priority, and automated enforcement, which cities like London use, could be a key element of that. On, beha on behalf of Mayor de Blasio, I want to say thank you to Chairman Rodriguez and many of your colleagues for your letter of January 24th on the improvement of bus service which is a priority that the city shares. In my written response, I've provided a program update. I also want to today to extend an offer for members of this committee and or their staffs to join me and the DOT staff for a field trip to a future select bus service route. That will allow us to together experience some of the implementation opportunities and challenges firsthand. For today, I want to quickly highlight several ways the city and the MTA are committed to working together for faster and more reliable bus service citywide. SBS has been the best example of that partnership. Over 10 years and 15 SBS routes, our two agencies have together improved travel times for over 300,000 daily riders by 10 to 30 percent, boosted ridership by 10 percent, provided more reliable service, generated very high customer satisfaction, and reduced crashes. To continue this progress, Mayor de Blasio announced in October that DOT and the MTA would grow SBS further with 21 new routes selected as part of a new bus forward plan. As part of the bus forward, DOT and MTA also identified local non-SBS route segments that have low speeds, poor reliability, or particularly long and slow trips. Our two agencies will work together to target these segments using some of our established techniques. Some of them learn from SBS, including new dedicated bus lanes, queue jumps, and other traffic engineering changes. As an MTA board member, I've also consistently pushed for the substantial expansion of all-door boarding on busy bus routes around the city, and I'm looking forward to the next generation contactless fare payment system that will ease the technological con conversion to all door boarding for all buses. We are also looking to enhance our efforts on transit signal priority, or TSP, where buses communicate with traffic signals to hold green lights or turn them green early. While we plan to greatly increase our pace of TSP installations, we also want to make sure we do high quality work. Our traffic engineers need to do the data con collection and analysis that will ensure bus riders the greatest travel time benefits while still promoting good overall traffic flow and protecting pedestrian safety. 
I would like to discuss steps we've taken to improve capital project delivery while acknowledging more needs to be done. As a result of streamlining DOT's internal procedures and more advanced project management IT, I am proud that we have doubled our annual capital project commitment rate over the last three years from an average of 41% in FY08 to 14 to 79% in FY15 to 17. And this greater efficiency comes as our entire capital plan doubled under Mayor de Blasio from 6.7 billion to its current level of 13.3 billion. Of course, no discussion of capital projects would be complete without once again underscoring the importance of state design build legislation. And I think uh, Chairman Gibson did a perfect job of explaining how important it is. It was terrific to join Speaker Johnson, Senator Kavanaugh, Assemblywoman Simon, and others a couple weeks ago on the Brooklyn Heights Promenade to make that case. It is essential for the BQE triple cantilever project. It could also be utilized for building new jail facilities so that we can close Rikers Island and to speed up the urgently needed repairs at NYCHA facilities. When it comes to capital delivery, in addition to the street reconstruction work I highlighted earlier, I'm also happy to say that this past year we've opened two new bridges, the brand new City Island Bridge and the new Mill Basin Bridge along the Belt Parkway. And this past fiscal year, DOT continued its record level of in-house street resurfacing with 1,324 lane miles resurfaced in fiscal year 17. We're on track to continue that record pace in fiscal year 18, and this budget maintains the previously increased funding to continue those lane miles in fiscal 19. Let me close by saying I believe there's much the administration and the council can do together to improve project delivery. Individually, each step in the process for executing capital projects had an understandable and reasonable purpose at one time. But now the accumulation of each of these requirements taken together has made New York City's procurement and capital delivery process arguably the most complicated in the world. DOT stands ready to be a helpful and engaged participant in this discussion. Finally, my written testimony details areas of savings that DOT has identified, 14.9 million in fiscal year 18 and 11.6 million in fiscal year 19. The mayor has once again challenged city agencies to identify ways to reduce expenses and DOT has worked closely with the mayor's office of management and budget to find efficiencies in our operations. Let me conclude by saying we have many important challenges and opportunities as we continue to keep New Yorkers moving safely, equitably, and sustainably while supporting our city's economic growth and prosperity. I want to thank the council for their support, for the opportunity to testify before you today, and happy to answer your questions. Thank you. I would like to acknowledge also that we've been joined by Commissioner Rosenthal and Menchaca. Uh, let me start with something that is that we can see every day now in our street because of the winter, which is potholes. How are we doing today with potholes? Are we on target? How much more action should we expect now that the snow hopefully will be over in winter? What is the goal? And what have we accomplished? And also, what is our plan? Right, I'm, I'm happy to say, and I'm, I'm looking now, joined by your colleague from Staten Island. When I, when I started in this job a little over four years ago, it was the number one complaint that I got everywhere, probably nowhere more than in Staten Island. And, you know, I, wa I want to thank the mayor and the council, the major investments that we have made in resurfacing. We have now, over the last four years, resurfaced over a quarter of the city's roadways. And we have really tried to focus, we've changed our whole operation to focus on doing more night work and really getting at the biggest and most challenging roads. And we have seen in those four years the pothole complaints that come in largely through 311 and others, they've gone down by 50%. So I take that as a real, and, and now our response time has dropped, I think, from two and a half days to under two days. Now, we've had a rough couple of months. We've had some real freeze and thaw. And at this time of year, it is always the pothole season, and we're working hard to keep on top of it. But I think overall, the investments that we've made in improving roadway conditions have helped reduce potholes tremendously. And we have, you know, again, in this budget, at least two more years of very robust resurfacing investments, which I hope will continue that good trend. One challenge we are starting to see, and again, we, we, hear, we hear about it in Staten Island and other places, 
because there is such a record pace of construction happening in the city, it is a challenge. Now that we're resurfacing so many roads, it can be more noticeable to see when construction and utilities and other activities then cut into those roads. That is another area where we are trying to work with our partners, the private utilities, fellow city agencies, and the private construction industry to minimize the damage and the impact on these newly resurfaced roadways and to make sure we restore them as best we can if work needs to be done on them. Right. So connecting with re, re, refreshing the street. And, you know, as you have seen yesterday, we will stand together with Family for Safe Streets, Transportation Alternative. With a, I think with a common cause that we have, which is continue redesigning our street, thinking on you know, how all the work that we do are connecting with Vision, connected with Vision Zero. And, you know, one good call that I would say the whole advocate coalition is putting and on the table. I know that you've been always a partner also listening and working with us, which is as we will see more reversing the street, how can we take advantage also to do both things at the same time? Reverse the street, but also doing a way that we can reduce the speed limit, especially in intersection to bring more features connected to Vision Zero. Yeah, it, it, it's a good question, and, and one that I think we're really trying hard to do a good job on. I mean, we do, we do very much try and coordinate our resurfacing and our safety work, and certainly right now as we are resurfacing, when we restore markings, we are using what is now the most up-to-date set of marking practices and doing what, you know, whatever we can to make those roadways safer. But there can sometimes be two separate tracks of projects. I mean, our resurfacing follows where we see that roadways have the most damage. Our most impactful roadway redesign safety work goes where we see the highest crash data. Sometimes those sets of roadways are aligned, but sometimes they're not. And you know, some of the things the advocates want us to do, particularly more involved safety treatments, putting in pedestrian islands, bike lanes, putting in some of those more major treatments, those are things that can take time and that we want to make sure we get right, and that often involves working with local elected officials, community boards, local businesses. So where we can put things in quickly, we do, but where things take more time and need closer design, we are going to need to do that. So we agree with the spirit of what they want us to do, and we're always trying to do a better job of aligning, but we won't always be able to do it. You mean for, for markings? It's another area where I want to I want to thank the mayor. He's he's actually tremendously increased the city's commitment in terms of uh, working with the council in terms of funding for marking. When I when I came to DOT, I will admit one of the things, and it it had perhaps crept up on the agency a little bit in the last administration and a bit in ours is as we have expanded our Vision Zero work and our bike lanes and bus lanes. That's a lot of markings, you know, millions and millions of linear feet of marking. And markings in the city, they take a pounding. Obviously, we have heavy traffic in the city. We have, you know, rough winters. And so, you know, we've realized over the past few years, we really need to increase the investment at the pace in which we refurbish markings. One of the challenges we've had, quite frankly, is it's not an industry with a lot of players. I mean, this gets a little bit at, at some of the things I think that the, the subcommittee on capital budget will be looking at. There are certain services and contracts that the city procures where you don't necessarily have 20 firms all competing to give you the best deal. You might only have one or two players in the industry. In the markings area, we've been trying to nurture some new firms so that we get more, in, we get more entrance, we get more capacity, we get better prices. I'd say that's a project we're still working our way through. Some of the firms that we brought on board have, I think they're still learning how to do good markings work on the tough streets of New York. Um, so it's an on, I would say that's one of the challenges my agency faces, continuing to expand our markings work, get high quality contractors to come. And you know, one of the reasons why, particularly after a difficult winter like this one, we're trying to move as aggressively as we can to refurbish markings where they've faded. Who is responsible for the sidewalk? The, the, sidewalk the sidewalk in New York City is a shared responsibility. And it is interesting. It is part of what makes it a complicated infrastructure and one I know that produces a lot of frustration on the part of 
elected officials, community boards, and average New Yorkers. Building owners are responsible for these sidewalks in front of their buildings. The city is responsible for the curb. And this is not an easy thing to litigate. Um, we have undertaken at the city level, as you know, a very energetic effort now to increase our investments in improving sidewalks. And particularly, I'm proud to say, in terms of sidewalks around NYCHA, uh, the city is making a much bigger contribution. We've more than tripled the amount of money we're putting into fixing sidewalks around NYCHA. We are also now greatly expanding our work on pedestrian ramps. As you know, the, the city has faced a lot of litigation over the years on making our pedestrian ramps more accessible. We're putting a lot of investments into that. But we're also trying to work with the utilities and all the private property owners and construction firms that are cutting into our sidewalks on any given day. I mean, part of the challenge is it's a system that is owned by hundreds of thousands of owners and at any different time being cut into and operated on by thousands of different players and making sure that all that work is being done to appropriate standards and that we're keeping all the ADA accessibility requirements enforced is certainly, I think, one of the, the big challenges facing us right now. Okay. Uh, bosses, I, I think that you, and you mentioned a couple of things in your, uh, in your opening. Uh, what, more, what more can we do when it comes to putting together our own both action plan. Because I, some of the things got to do with the MTA. And MTA said this morning that they are open, as they have been, a working collaboration with DOT. But, you know, buses are so important, especially in many parts of the five world. So, and they are running so slow, and they are not getting there on time. So, and this is like a sheer responsibility that we feel that enforcement, as I say in my opening statement, is or not. So how can we increase the level of involvement to increase enforcement to protect the bosses to have priority, you know, to work with the MTA to install the technology so that we run them on time, that we can put together our own New York City Bosses action plan. Well, I, 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 I'm glad you started with enforcement because I absolutely think that's a key component. And, you know, as I said in my testimony, I mean, we were very heartened by the fact that in the governor's 30 day budget amendments, he proposed that the city be allowed to use camera enforcement for block the box violations south of 60th Street in Manhattan. We desperately need a similar kind of ability to use cameras to enforce bus lanes. Right now, the city has the ability to use cameras only on 16 bus routes throughout the city. And as much as, look, NYPD has their role in enforcement, um, as, as much as NYPD has their role in enforcement, I don't think it's realistic to say that NYPD is going to enforce every bus route every day. A lot of cities, again, like London and other places, are moving to automated enforcement. That is a much more effective way to ensure you are keeping those, those bus lanes clear. So that is something the city certainly would love to see happen up in Albany. We would love the support of council members. Um, that is just a key fundamental thing we need to do on the enforcement front. Not to say NYPD can't be doing more, but I think realistically speaking, we need, we need camera enforcement ability. So, Councilmember Brah has a few words to the commission, and we just had a question with the co. Uh, I have to go get a root canal, so I'm going to skip my question. I am so sorry. Which I know is a big disappointment to everyone here. Um, but I just want to say thank you for moving so quickly to make those commitments on 9th Street. And, uh, you know, we've all just been really shattered in the neighborhood by the deaths of Abby and, and Josh this week. And, um, I think the way that you put it out, you know, we've, we've done a lot. The fact that pedestrian fatalities are at their lowest level ever um, is real, and we got a lot more to do, and every time something like this happens, it's just hard to feel anything other than that commitment to do more. So to move so quickly and make those commitments today really means a lot to me and, and no, my thank you, Thank you, Council Member, and, and your leadership at this tough time. Obviously, we'll be working closely with you and I think other members from, from nearby neighborhoods. I think many of us who live in that part of Brooklyn feel this keenly, and. 
um, you know, I think we'll all be ready to move really quickly. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, both chairs. Chair Thank you so much, Chair Rodriguez, and good afternoon, Commissioner, to you and your team once again. Um, I first and foremost certainly want to recognize and thank you for you and your agency's commitment to Vision Zero. When I previously chaired public safety, Chair Rodriguez and I traveled to every borough to hear from New Yorkers around what we can do to improve um, pedestrian, bicyclist uh, safety, driver safety, and really make sure that we continue to share our streets. They belong to all of us and not just to one population. And you know, that was a very ambitious uh, initiative and I'm proud to see the Vision Zero has achieved so much. And certainly like Council Member Van Bramer with Queens Boulevard, the Grand Concourse also has had major reconstruction. So I'm so grateful that we have been able to achieve great success and not having any fatalities along the Grand Concourse, um, which is most of my district. So I really want to thank you for that. And certainly as we continue to implement Vision Zero and certainly uh, speed cameras and other measures where we may need Albany's approval, you know that you can always count on me. Um, I'm no stranger to Albany. Thank you. <laughs> so first I wanted to ask a, a basic question and it's just the interagency coordination um, that DOT does all of the capital work on our streets but there is a lot of interagency coordination with DEP, uh, with utility companies like Con Edison. So my primary question is who is the primary agency that is tasked with ensuring that when DOT is done, we let Con Edison know, we let, you know, the buildings department. How does all of that work? Because I guess many of us have been frustrated that when projects are completed, the streets are messed up. And they're certainly in worse condition than when projects have started. And most of the time, it's not DOT's work that caused these issues, it's another agency or maybe a utility company. So my question is how do we make sure that we um, increase the capacity of communication with interagencies and making sure that if DOT is doing work, uh, the work is done on time and then the streets are repaved and it's back to what we deem as normal? So it, it's a great question, and I, I, I certainly know an area that's a big challenge and, and where I think all of us, we've made a lot of efforts, which I'll, I'll describe, but certainly always more we could do. We meet, DOT, we meet monthly with all the major utilities, and we try best we can to harmonize our upcoming resurfacing schedules with planned work that they need to do. We also work with our fellow sister agencies Probably the other agency that's most in the streets is, is DEP, with all the tremendous water and sewer work they need to do on a water and sewer system, which in some places is over 100 years old. So, you know, we, we try very hard to coordinate. And, you know, part of the reason, one of the things I hear frustration from council members is you mill the street, you scrape off the asphalt, and then you leave it milled for two to three weeks, and it drives everybody crazy. You should resurface it right away. Part of the reason we leave the street open is to try and encourage utilities or sister agencies to get in there while the street is open and do the work they need to do. And a lot of times they do do that, sometimes not, but, but that's, I know it annoys people to no end when the street is milled and unpaved, but there is, there is a method to the madness. There, that's part of the reason we do that. But it is also true, particularly for utilities like DP or Con Ed or National Grid, that if there is some kind of an emergency condition and they need to get, get back into the street, they're going to have to cut the street back open. And, and you all know what those conditions could be. Could be, could be a pipe leaking, could be a gas leak, could be a power outage. I mean, and, you know, one of the things that makes the New York Street so complicated is we have such a dense bundle of infrastructure under the surface. And a lot of that infrastructure is very old. So I don't think we have totally solved the problem of making sure that everything gets fixed every time we open up a roadway, but we do try and meet regularly and coordinate. And I, I know it's an area the council has expressed interest in being involved and one we would be certainly happy to do so. I think if there are ways we can make the system better, we, we would love to explore those. Thank you. Uh, design build, I mean, we've talked a lot about it and I think my colleagues and I have a good understanding of what we can achieve with design build authorization. Um, this is nothing new. Uh, agencies have received this authorization before. Um, you joined colleagues in announcing that 
you wanted to put pressure on the state and we join you in terms of the BQE project. So I wanted to first understand how soon must the city receive the authorization in order to begin using design build? And then what happens if we don't get design build? How would the process of design bid build procurement method certainly delaying us? We could potentially save $158 million, shave off two years. So tell us about some of the consequences that we face if we don't get design build authorization. Right, and, and I know you're, you're asking, you're referring specifically to the portion of the BQE project, but just to be clear, I mean, the city's initial opening point is the city should have broad design build authority mm -hmm. for a whole bunch of projects, not just that right. one. I mean, we, we, we can think of a number of DOT projects where we could, mm -hmm. you know, shave time and money off the project. And I mentioned some of the other areas could be useful for speeding up NYCHA projects, for building new prison facilities as we right. try and close Rikers, for new police facilities, new libraries. I mean, it is a tool, as you correctly point out, it's not new. We are probably one of the only cities now in the country that doesn't have the ability to use it. And in other countries, in Europe and Asia, it's been state of the art for decades. In terms specifically of the BQE, time is short. Um, I've been up in Albany, you know, joined by city colleagues and others uh, for the past few years lobbying on behalf of Design Build. We are kind of at the crunch time. Uh, to stay, we have a bit of a, as you mentioned, we have a bit of a deadline now looming, which is in around the year 2026, okay. we're going to have to probably start putting weight restrictions on that structure, which is an antiquated Robert Moses era structure never designed to carry nearly the volume and weight of vehicles that it carries. And that means if a weight restriction, as you said, that means diverting trucks onto local streets, which I don't think anybody wants to have happen. So we very much, from the city's point of view, need to get design build authority in this current budget. And I am pleased to say, and I think, uh, you know, uh, the governor's council just wrote a letter to the speaker, I think some of you were copied on it, saying very explicitly that the governor agrees that design build is essential for the BQE. So we were heartened to see that. Um, and we really hope that will come to pass. Because if we can't get that in the next couple of months, and we have to go the traditional if we get design build, we can get the project done, we believe, by 2026 and avert that situation. If we can't, we're probably running a year or two after that. And um, that's going to have severe impacts on the local community. And again, cost city taxpayers extra dollars. The state isn't giving us any money for this project. It's all city dollars right now. And again, magnify those impacts on the local community. So we were, we were heartened to, to see the letter from the governor's council. and. We've had much support here on the city council. We're making a, a big push in this budget cycle. If we don't get it, we're, you know, we will explore if there's potentially any other options for the city, but we will find ourselves in a very difficult position. Okay, and let me also, um, for clarity, the state can give agency design build authorization as well as project-based authorization as well. So there are two types of measures the, where the, they can say DOT, you can des do design build for any project or specifically a project. Right, or, or the, the state could say anyone could do design build anytime they wanted on anything. I mean, the state could provide as broad an authority as it chose to. In some states around the country, design build is the, is the main method used for all procurement. So the state could, on any continuum, go from we're giving it to you for one project to everybody everywhere can use it as needed. And I would just say, you, you, we would never use it in every instance. It's just one procurement tool that we would like to have in our toolbox, as almost every other jurisdiction around the world does at this point, okay. including the state. Right, okay. So DOT's capital plan is broken down into six divisions, the waterway bridges, Ferris and aviation, highway bridges, highways, transportation equipment, and traffic. And as I mentioned in my opening, your commitment rate is above the city's um, average of commitment rates. Um, but there are two divisions that I noticed are below the city's commitment rate, and that's the waterway bridges, which we have around 24%, and then transportation, which is about 41%. So I wanted to ask you specifically in terms of the fluctuation in commitment rates, what challenges did DOT face in waterway bridges and transportation um, that caused the commitment rate to be at this level? 
Yeah, and, and I have to confess, I know that those are sort of the categories that you all look at our budget in. They're, they're yes. not actually really the categories in which we break down she our division, so okay. maybe my budget director will look. Okay. I'll, 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 I'll talk a little okay. bit about the commitment rate and then speculate. We may have to get back to you on the okay, details, because sure, no those problem. two categories aren't really how we okay. break down our program. But I, I'm, I'm pleased you mentioned the commitment rate, because when I, when I came in as commissioner four years ago, we did have a very low capital commitment rate. And to be fair, it was not something that the city necessarily put a lot of focus on. But in this okay. administration, at that time, OMB Director Dean Foulihan said to me, mm -hmm. your capital commitment rate is not good. And we really, we really took a lot of steps to try and improve that percentage. I mean, first of all, to be more, more accurate and honest in exactly asking for what we thought we could spend, and then doing a scrub of everything that we do internally to try and speed up that process and making a, a dashboard to track our capital projects and in some ways really husbanding certain projects through the process, which as you can know can involve numerous oversight agencies, the comptroller's office, all kinds of different steps along the way. So to, to get that capital commitment rate up has taken a lot of very hands-on work. It, is, it has not been easy. Now I, I think all right, we'll, we'll have to get back. I mean, I have a speculation on the what you're calling the waterborne bridges, which maybe are ones that are movable bridges that potentially involve state and federal uh, agencies. Well. Yeah, but I don't know. Let us okay. let us double. Let's, uh, I'm sorry to say, not hadn't seen that particular breakdown. So we'll try and get okay, you an answer sure, on that fine. while we're you sitting can follow here. Follow up on that. Um, and then I also lastly wanted to ask before we get to our other colleagues, um, DOT works very closely with DDC, Department of Design and Construction, on certain capital projects. And they are to date managing uh, several of your DOT projects. So I wanted to ask about your relationship and partnership with DDC. When do you decide to bring them on board um, during the design phase? And how has that partnership been? And in terms of the work you're doing and improvements and more efficiencies, where are those areas where you see DOT being able to improve? Yeah, th this, this is a, a rich topic and one probably I assume your, your subcommittee may spend a lot of time exploring. Because I think New York has a pretty unique system, which some of you may recall was sort of created back in the Giuliani administration of trying, because as I've said, our roadways are so complex. We have the roadway infrastructure above, water and sewer and utility infrastructure below, and DDC was created to try and harmonize all that work. And then obviously they took on other types of work, buildings and a whole bunch of different projects for the city. And I would say DDC now has a lot of projects on their plate. You know, the way we do project planning you know, over the past few years, we have really tried to improve that coordination. And in fact, the major capital agencies, DOT, DDC, DEP, and Parks, we all now meet on a very regular basis, basically to troubleshoot. Because so many of our projects are integrated, and so many times we'll find that there's a bottleneck happening in some corner of some agency. And when all the commissioners and the teams come together, we can work through them. But we do have a capital process where, D, where DOT works through the projects that are our priorities. We work with you all and City Hall to determine those priorities. DEP has their own set of priorities. Ours are above the surface, theirs are below the surface. And then to some degree, it does fall to DDC to try and harmonize that. And it can be, it can be challenging. And our, we've tried to better align that upfront planning process. DDC is trying to do more of that now. But definitely, this is one of the, you know, the arrangements that makes the New York City capital process so complicated. Okay, thank you. Chair Rodriguez. Thank you, Chair. Uh, so colleagues, instead of having two rounds of one, three minutes, and then two, we're gonna put in yes, five minutes, so that you can use it to the best of your ability. Uh, <laughs> so Council Member Credential, followed by Council Member Van Bramer, empowers. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Commissioner, for being here today. Uh, generally a pleasure to work with uh, Commissioner Garcia in Queens, and uh, her and her team have been very responsive. I will be in Albany on Tuesday, so we will be pushing design build. I'll be speaking to my former colleagues. And I will say about Milling Street, sometimes the milled product is better than what was there before, depending on how bad it was. So it's not always so bad. A couple of quick questions. Uh, with DOT, I have, I think, 14 speed cameras, and they're a source of uh, great aggravation to many of my constituents. 
I do tell them to slow down, but not that often because, you know, I'd like to get reelected. But the truth of the matter is, um, would you support signage before the speed camera? Because if the real idea is to create public safety, um, and I know that bill was carried before he passed away in Albany by uh, my dear friend Mike Sabanowitz, but would you support legislation in, in the state legislature that would require signage to say within the next 100, 200 yards, whatever the distance we determine, there's a speed camera? We, we, we have said we would support it in the context of doing some kind of expansion of the program. Okay. And, 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 and just, I mean, we have put up signs all over the city that do say city speed limit, photo enforce. So, I mean, I, I am hoping that New Yorkers are on some notice that the city does deploy speed cameras well, around I, the city. Well, I get that, but, you know, it, it hits my area a lot harder than some other areas. Um, I don't want to pick on anybody else's district, but 14 is a lot. And, um, you know, I'll leave it at that. Um, second question, uh, curbing. This goes back to, I've been in government 30 years. Um, I have never had an easy time of getting anybody a new curb. I've owned three houses in New York City. All three of them had either a curb that was about this high or just totally obliterated curbs from decades and decades. The curbs in front of my house, I guess, are about 65 years old. David Weprin is carrying legislation at my behest in Albany that would allow a property tax credit for anybody that wanted to rebuild their curb. The curb is the responsibility of the city DOT. Could the city support that legislation? We put people to work. I know it would mean less tax revenue for the city, but it would also give us new curbs and it would keep our sewers from being filled up as quickly as possible with the schmutz that comes off my, my lawn. I think probably supporting a bill like that would be a decision made above my pay grade. But would, you, I, would you be happy to recommend that to? Well, I, I will Honor? certainly bring your your recommendation back to back to our leadership at City Hall, and we recognize, you know, look, I, I'll just be honest because you know we've been to many town halls, and and some of you at your town halls, the issue of curbs has come up, and it's we have <laughs> yours being one, and and there are some places where we're making investments in curbs and as you know we have a new contract now it's about it's I'm just got a note here it's going to be registered this spring by DDC so we'll, we'll how big a contract would that be Adam That's a good, how much is it we'll check on the number it's would not enormous and look there's a reason why and you know we're gonna I think in the obviously in this coming budget cycle talk about all the city's capital needs and we are going to be putting some money into curbs but it is competing against a lot of other as you know very it's, important it's, priorities building housing uh, no I, I get all that but you know, that's why I, I proposed the property tax credit so that people could do it themselves with your approval of course you would have to have a permit issued and DOT would have to inspect and approve of the work in it's my experience it would be easier to drive to Mars than it is to get a curb installed in the city of New York well, but I'll leave it at we that will, we will have a new contract that's over Hopefully many commissioners it'll be easier than going to Mars I don't know about that anyway my last question is um, congestion pricing not a fan, lots of people in Eastern Queens. Um, one of the things that I've talked about when I've talked to the press about this is perhaps we have HOV lanes on the Long Island Expressway, the Staten Island Expressway, other, the Gowanus. Uh, would, would you be in favor of perhaps putting, and there is an HOV lane leading up to the Midtown Tunnel uh, as you approach from the Queens side. Would you be in favor of HOV lanes on the major bridges going into Manhattan at rush hour um, so that people would maybe have some incentive to double up or triple up and they'd be able to get into Manhattan faster. It, it's interesting. The, the, the issue of HOV lanes has very much arisen in the context of the L train shutdown. And as I mentioned in my testimony, we will be pursuing in putting in an HOV lane on the Williamsburg Bridge. And the mayor has actually said publicly, he, I mean, I think he's a little bit with you and that he probably given his, given a choice, would prefer to go the HOV route. We will have an opportunity to see how well it works. Um, we would like to have some potentially automated enforcement ability there too, because again, they're not particularly on our East River bridges, unlike the MTA's bridges. There aren't big toll plaza areas no, I, I where that. you can sort of pull people over and enforce it. I understand Enforcing that, but is a challenge, but we're, we're certainly going I'm, to be I'm, trying I'm it I'm all for reducing congestion but my constituents drive in and they park and then they leave. They're not really the part. It's, it's really, I, I believe, the 30,000 plus um, via Lyft, Uber people that have 
taken over the streets of Manhattan. With that, I thank you, Madam Chair, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you. Councilmember uh, Brown Bramer, followed by Councilmember Powers. How was that, huh? Thank you very much to both chairs. Um, Commissioner, first let me just say um, I'm very excited about Queens Boulevard uh, Phase 1, our capital uh, project moving forward. I know it went to the Transportation Committee. I know there's some questions about uh, the bus treatments there, but I am uh, very supportive of that moving forward as quickly as possible. And uh, it's among the things I'm most proud of uh, in my career and certainly working together with you and your agency on that. I wanted to ask a couple of questions uh, very specific to, to Long Island City. Tomorrow we're going to be on Vernon Boulevard, again rallying with parents for some more traffic calming measures, um, which I hope we can get accomplished. But I wanted to talk because I know that there's a, a, a comprehensive uh, uh, study um, with respect to Long Island City. There's also the capital uh, reconstruction project that we announced together some $40 million a couple of years ago. Um, and, and I was wondering if you could provide an update on both and how they come together to make our streets safer in Long Island City, one of the fastest growing, busiest uh, sections in Long Island City. Uh, obviously parents all over the city of New York are, are feeling this much more so in the wake of the tragedy in Brooklyn. They certainly are. We, we recognize that. And, you know, we, we, we have been working very closely with you, I think, on a, a, a bunch of good improvements in Long Island City, and, and we're hoping we'll have more to come. We're, we're working in double time on it. Um, I think on the sort of the larger project study, I, I'd actually like to sit down and give you a briefing on it, because I think there's some places where we could talk some things through and get some input. So if that'd be okay, maybe we can set that up in the And the, the capital reconstruction, uh, I know that there was some uh, delays perhaps because of DEP work, but also because of the potential effect of a BQX route. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yes, there have been, as is always sometimes the case with complicated potential street reconstruction work, yeah, we've had some, some DEP issues and making sure that the infrastructure they're going to have there is going to be adequate for all the growth that's to come, and then some, you know, BQX issues. So again, maybe we can sit down with you and walk you through the latest. Okay. I just think it would be, uh, who knows what's going to happen with the BQX, but um, obviously the people along in the city need and want those changes uh, uh, ASAP. Um, I wanted to ask about because uh, you mentioned SBS, and you know the administration has uh, some grand plans for Long Island City, which include even more growth. Um, that is a lot of people concerned. Of course, one of the main concerns is where are people going to, how are people going to get to and from Manhattan? How are they going to get to work? The seven train can only accommodate just so many folks. Um, and I know that my colleague to my right uh, experiences that as well, uh, with folks originating there in Flushing. But um, do you, as the Transportation uh, Commissioner and or your department, sit with Department of City Planning and is select bus service and other additional bus service, is this something that you're all considering? Clearly it's something I'm asking of the mayor, but um, I'm a little alarmed that we don't seem to be in the pipeline. I mean, we do sit with Department of City Planning and with the MTA in planning out what the next set of bus routes are going to look like. And, you know, particularly we have focused on bus routes where there is not good subway service and very high ridership. If there are bus routes you think should be on, and, and this, I would say this in general because, you know, many council members wrote and said we want to see a lot more bus lanes, we would be thrilled to work with you on that. We would welcome your suggestions on where you would like them because, as you know, some communities embrace them, and some communities they can be astonishingly unpopular. So if there are places you think we're overlooking, we would love to, to work with you on that. Um, you know, we Trust are me, we, could, we, will, we will provide you with routes, uh, multiple routes all over Western Queens. Um, I know they can be difficult to, uh, uh, to implement in some ways, but, and my next question is the L train and its effect on the seven line we have no other choice, right? We desperately need those other options for people to get to and from work because with 
the pace of development. With where we're already at with the seven train, folks can't get on, which leads me to my next question. So we'll get you those bike, uh, those uh, 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 select bus service routes. Um, but then of course there needs to be the funding and the will to do it. Um, but with the L train, we are very concerned that a lot of folks from Brooklyn, uh, our friends from Brooklyn, are going to find their way uh, to uh, Queens to connect from the G to the 7 or the E and or E. Uh, we are already at capacity, if not over capacity, and I'd love to hear your thoughts on how we're going to make sure that Brooklyn continue to get, can continue to get to work, uh, but not at the expense of the good people of Queens who are going to be fighting with the good people of Brooklyn to get on those 7 and E trains if everyone's coming from Brooklyn on the G to go north. I hope that peace can, can remain between Brooklyn and Queens, that we can have <laughs> hands over uh, the Newtown Creek. Um, and as I mentioned in my testimony, we have had really now with the MTA over a two-year planning process. And they, I think, have done, and maybe, you know, I, I, I've been hearing, I think there's more interest in us perhaps coming and spending more time talking to, to some of the Queen's stakeholders. I think they have done a very thorough and detailed job of figuring out where to add subway service. And their goal is to basically accommodate about 80 to 85 percent of the Brooklyn subway riders on not so much the 7, but on the G, on the JMZ, and then to take what will be the sort of 15 to 20 remaining of this population and run some really good bus service. And that's why HOV over the Williamsburg Bridge dedicated bus lanes in Williamsburg and then along 14th Street to try and make that bus riding experience one that is reliable and that has travel times that will keep people on the bus. They will be running, we will be running a ferry and you know, building out some very, very robust um, protected bicycle infrastructure as well as potentially working with Motivate to really make bike share a bigger component. So, you know, we are leaving no stone unturned and trying to make sure we can help the Brooklynites come in directly to Manhattan, but I think would be happy to sit down and, and talk to you. I mean, believe me, well aware of how crowded the number seven is and that the MTA still has a lot of work they need to do on that line, which is only making the challenge that much bigger. Thank you. Thank you. Councilman Power, followed by Councilman thank, thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you for your testimony. And congratulations to our new chair on the Subcommittee for Capital Funding on your, on your first official hearing. Um, I had a, want to pick up on the L train just for a second, which is to say, uh, first of all, thank you to, uh, for coming to City Hall a few weeks back and meeting with all the stakeholders on the Manhattan side to talk about impact and hear the questions and concerns. When do we, on the, on the Manhattan side, I know there's a lot of boroughs involved here, Jimmy's and Quinn, Brooklyn, when, when are we, or maybe all of us, expected to see a final plan or a new plan that incorporates all of the, con the comments and concerns that will come, and then what's the process after that? Right, so, so as you know, we, we've had a number of meetings with stakeholders and elected officials. We did, uh, we, well, we did a round of meetings last year, and then in the past couple months, we've done uh, a series of open houses, uh, east and west side around 14th Street, and then as well in Williamsburg. Um, we are getting a lot of feedback from all those meetings. We're, we're doing now another round of stakeholder meetings, particularly with on the Manhattan side with some of the block association and institutions along 13th and 14th Street. And we, are, we have committed to and we're going to do some more public town hall meetings where, you know, I think it'll be a very spirited debate. We're hoping, I think, to do that. I'm looking over at Rebecca Zach, I think, in the next month or so. And we are absorbing all the input that people are making. We're going to, I would say, probably within the end of that process, within a month or so, put out what will be our next iteration. Refinements. Our next refinements, yes. And look, I think, obviously, f for, for Lower Manhattan, the, the two big issues that are debating is, you know, are we happy with the configuration of the busway and on 14th Street and how many hours a day should it operate? And the, the protected bike lane, should it be two-way on 13th Street? Should it be on 12th and 13th? Should it be on other I think those, I mean, that's my sense of sort of the big issues we're still debating on the Manhattan side. I think we're taking input in and I'm hoping in about a month from now we'll, we'll come down with what we think is really our final set of recommendations. Some of these things we need to start implementing this spring as the weather turns warm because you know, the, the L train shuts down in April of 2019, and we can't wait until then to do all the markings and other work we need to do after the winter. We won't have enough time. Got it. Thank you. And I, I appreciate your 
large imagination on 14th Street. I supported doing the mostly what you guys are doing too, so I appreciate that. Um, switching topics on my two and a half minutes left here, uh, the Midtown congestion plan, um, I wanted to get an update. You guys had I, uh, the, the mayor's congestion plan announced on October. I know you're in different stages. You had just announced this week the block to box. Can you tell me where you, and obviously a little bit briefly, just tell me where you are on the other measures? Right, we, we, I, I stood with Chief Chan and we, we, put the, we put the paint down on the 50th of the 50 block the box sites we're doing where NYPD is gonna be doing stepped up enforcement. If you go on our website or if we can supply to the committee, we have that list. It's 30 sites in Manhattan and 20 in the outer boroughs. Next step coming this month is going to be in Brooklyn on Flatbush and in Queens what we're calling the clear curves, which is basically trying to keep the curbs free of delivery and double parking, et cetera, during the rush hour period. Flatbush um, uh, from, from Grand Army Plaza down to, to the Manhattan Bridge and then in Roosevelt and Jackson Heights. Coming in April, we're going to get to the Midtown portion. Well, what's the date in April? I think April, early April. Yeah. Early April. Like April 2nd, we'll, we'll get that underway. And, and remember, there's two, two components to that. There is also what we're calling a clear curbs uh, portion in that block that I mentioned in my testimony, mm -hmm. trying to minimize deliveries during the rush hour periods. And then also on, a, on some of the crosstown pairs, trying to clear one side of the street and make it a travel lane. So I, 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 as you can imagine, we're a few weeks away from the Manhattan side of it, and I'm wondering, uh, well, I've heard, at least I should say, some concern about the delivery aspect of it, and not just the folks that are, and I, by the way, I, I was at the press conference with the mayor, supportive of ways to reduce congestion. I support congestion pricing, but um, I, I'm concerned that we are, we are weeks away and that we have a big group of property owners, businesses, restaurant owners, small grocery stores, schools perhaps, who are gonna have a radical shift in what they're gonna have to do in terms of deliveries, perhaps even add more trucks on. I, can you give me some sense of where you are in outreach to those groups yes, and, and, and what their and feedback is? I completely understand the concern. And, ju and just so you know, we have been meeting with the industry groups, the shippers, we are having our street ambassadors go door to door to businesses to make sure they know what's coming. And look, we view this as a pilot. So I, you know, I heard you say like, this is going to be a radical shift. I have a feeling this will sort of be something that will come together with a little bit of gradualness. I don't think we're gonna flip a switch tomorrow and everything will be cleared. I, I think it will be an iterative process. And I have committed to local bids, to the business groups, et cetera, that we will try and work with them. Our goal here is not to come out on day one and blanket vehicles with a thousand tickets. But I think the mayor does feel strongly, and we've heard it from council members and from so many other people, that we need to try to step up our enforcement and keeping, and, and for a lot of what we're trying to do in Midtown, it's basically enforcing the curb restrictions that already exist, that just have not been as enforced as they should be. But I, I, I can assure you, we will try and work very much with the business community and the shipper community. We will have an open line of communication if you see there are ways that things are really coming off the rails you know, we will make sure we're in communication with you. We're not trying to do this as a, you know, something that's going to be punitive and drastic. But yeah, I will, and I will just hand it back over because I know my time's up, but I'll, I'll just note that I was there in October. I, I had heard, I thought very little in between, and maybe there was outreach happening, but from my side, after that October hearing, I thought it was actually going in effect in like January, but I had heard very little from there about it. So I'm not surprised that others are, are surprised that there's, it's dropping in. But, but just to note, the reason it didn't go into effect in January is because we talked to the shippers and some of the businesses and they told us we're not ready in January. So we agreed I, to, I to move the date. So there, ha there has been some doubt. I agree more, we know we need to do more to get the word out. Thank you. And before calling the next co uh, colleague, I also like to voice to Powers, which is we've been getting a lot of uh, uh, push from the advocate. And, and also from the stakeholders, which many of them make sense, which is about uh, the impact of that it will have on delivering food and all those type of items in that area, especially in the Midtown. So I don't know, and I'm one of those who believe that delivery should happen at night. Uh, I uh, believe that, you know, if there's any effort or continued conversation with all those groups that you've been meeting for, years or month, 
in trying to come out with a plan that, you know, that we also build some consensus or some win-win situation. I think that this is something that I hope to see some progress in that direction. And if that will mean that the starting day issue can be delayed to give some time for conversation, I think that I would like to bring it to the table for you to consider. Well, let's, I mean, let, maybe we can follow up on this. And we have certainly been talking to some of the major shippers and the, the major businesses in the city. What can we do to shift more deliveries to nighttime? And it, it's proved a very complicated discussion. There's a lot of reluctance to change, you know, drivers' work schedules. There can be union rules there. A lot of times in neighborhoods where there's both residential and commercial, residential doesn't want to have the noise of trucks at night, although there are technologies now that can make trucks quieter. So an area we are certainly exploring, but one that's not without its challenges. Great. Thank you. Councilmember Doge, followed by Councilmember Ku and Menchaka. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, Commissioner. Uh, good afternoon, Rebecca. And I don't know your name. But, um, Elizabeth. Good afternoon. Elizabeth. Good afternoon. Uh, so first, uh, there's two things this, uh, I'd like to touch upon. Number one is um, we all know that uh, parking in uh, New York City is a major problem. And by people looking for parking, it causes congestion, causes pollution, and everything else that comes with it. So um, I have brought this up once in the past, and I also had uh, conversations with the, with the fire department, with the commissioner, and that would be, um, there, there are 110,000 fire hydrants throughout the city. And if we could relocate some of those hydrants, they are near bus shelters um, or near curb cuts, the areas where anyway you cannot park, to uh, increase the amount of parking spots throughout the city. So even if we get a fraction of that 110,000 um, fire hydrants, uh, then we have we will come a long way with increasing parking uh, throughout the city. Because we all know with the new SBSs that are going on all over the city, I used to be so happy to see you, Commissioner, when you came come to City Hall. Now every time you come in, I figured another SBS in my district. But that was a joke. But um, if we could all work together with well, DOT, just the ones, the one. <laughs> uh, with DOT and DEP and the fire department, if we could all work together to see, because the fire department, the commissioner said he's definitely open to it. There's um, there's some guidelines, but it's not really you know like if you're just moving it, uh, you know, uh, several feet or like uh, mid, as long as it's safe for the residents, he has no problem with it. So if we can get the EP involved and put something, a pilot program in my district for this budget, that would be great if we could do that and just try some areas to see how it would work out. I'll even, I'll even just add to that because um, it is something we have talked to DDC about because there's another way which I think could both create some more parking spaces and enhance safety, which is to move a lot of the fire hydrants are sort of quite a few feet in from the, cur from the corner. If you put them closer to the corner, that's often a place where we would like to daylight for safety. So we've actually sort of thought along those lines as well. Happy to be part of that discussion. Thank you. Just name it after me. Uh, second um, question I have <laughs> is you spoke about milling and paving. So after milling, you have several weeks that you don't pave because you send out notices to utility companies, sister agencies, and everything. So I know for my district, I don't remember the last time that milling was done and that a sister agency or a brother agency or a utility company actually came out to do work. So do you have any figures in 2017 of how many projects, because you would have it because there would be permits out, how many permits were actually uh, given and done, work was done during that milling and paving? I'm just curious to yeah, know. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure we could get you something on that. And I, I just want to add, because there is one other reason that we leave that gap. And I, I know it's frustrating and, and something that council potentially wants to take action on. Part of the way that we get so many lane miles done every year is we work a little nimbleness into the system. Because weather can sometimes intervene, snow can intervene and pull our crews onto other things. So by leaving a bit of a gap between the milling and the paving, it also gives us a little operational flexibility, but let us see. I think we probably could get you some sort of a number for that. Yeah, because that's, I believe it is the flexible, um, you know, just to have that, because you also have, I think, it's a different company that comes out or a different contractor that may come out and do the paving. So it's very hard to coordinate as soon as you finish milling the street to pave it. 
but but we should if if the if the number is not large, uh, you know, if we don't have a high number of utility companies, assisted agencies that are actually doing work, we need to figure out a way to shorten that because people not only get frustrated because they, they get property damage, then they come into our offices, they file a claim with the controller's office, and why should people have to go through a whole hassle and have the vehicles damaged or bikes, right? Um, how can you drive a bike on a on a milled street? So this is something I think we need to look into and to close that and to make sure that it gets done sooner. Okay. Well, let us. This is a good question. Let us see. If Thank we you. Can Name that after me numbers. too. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councilmember Deutsch. And we've also been joined by Councilmember Rafael Espinal and Councilmember Steve Levin. Next, we will have Councilmember Ku, followed by Councilmember Menchaca. Thank you. Thank you, both chairs, and thank you, Commissioner. And uh, I think you are one of the most approachable commissioners I ever met. Yeah. We always see you in different districts uh, doing, helping the, our local communities. So my, my my first, first, first question is that uh, you talk about a box. We have a box in Flushing too. It's the parking lot uh, between 138 and Union and, 37, and 38 and 39 Avenue. There used to be the old municipal parking. Because people always complain to me that once they get in the parking lot, they cannot get out, you know. It takes them 30 minutes or 45 minutes just to, to drive two blocks to, to get out to the uh, Lofton Boulevard, you know. So uh, somehow uh, maybe you can you have to help us uh, to redesign the the traffic there so that when they they can leave the parking lot easy because they, right now they cannot leave the parking lot because cars keep coming down you know? so we need either traffic agents or or other devices to help them uh, to get uh, out the parking lot uh, because hmm. happy to, that is a, a very challenging spot that that. I have I've been to with you, but happy to come out again and maybe put yeah. some some. We we have now um, a really great uh, uh, new leader in our our traffic operations division, and I have to say he's been able to come to some spots mm -hmm. in the city that have been places where we've had perennial challenges and bring a, f a fresh eyes to it. So so let us do that and see if yeah. We can come yeah, up thank with you. Some, uh, otherwise, we are dying from uh, from our own success, you know. Because if it's too congested, people won't come. You know, then the local business won't won't, uh, won't be successful. The second question is, uh, you're talking about your box, the, paint, the painting on the, on the streets, the big box and the intersection, so cars can enter, right? But I find usually it's the buses that are st stuck there all the time. Usually, the, especially the long buses, the SBS buses, because they don't, when they make a turn, they always start at the box. So do you give them tickets or no? We, um, we don't generally give them tickets, and I will admit that it's, it's sort of a special challenge for the buses, given their length. Again, particularly, as you say, the articulated buses for SBS. I mean, I would ask you as a driver, if you can see that you are not really going to make it through that intersection before the light turns red, <laughs> don't go for it. If you are a bus with 100 people on it, and there'll never be a space big enough for you, maybe I'll have a little sympathy that sometimes you find yourself stuck there, but certainly we, we hear from the MTA and from the bus drivers that they are frustrated by the traffic as well, so you know, we hope they will help us. And in some of the block-the-box locations, maybe you know, if you all have ones where you particularly see buses are getting stuck, those might be places where particularly we need NYPD intervention, where we need them to be really directing traffic uh, you know, with, with actual agents. So the next question I have is on the green taxis. No, no we have a lot of green taxis. Uh, especially around the uh, Roosevelt Main Street area, uh, afterward, uh, be, be, they all like stay on the streets and they tie up the traffic, right? Double park. Or so, is there any way we build a taxi stand for them, so that they go to go to the stand and they wait there instead of uh, blocking uh, on Roosevelt and Main Street? I mean, we you know we do we do put taxi stands around yeah. the city so we can we can come take a look at that location. And see sure, that, that would be good, great help because a lot of drivers ask me, hey, Councilman, why don't you set up a taxi stand for us to to park? No, instead of you know, driving on the uh, circling around main main street downtown area and blocking all the uh, all the traffic. Okay, thanks. Okay. Then the last question I have is uh, about these uh, pedestrian ramps. I noticed. The city has a program for pedestrian, pedestrian ramps. So can you define what is a pedestrian ramp? Is, uh, is this the one across the street? You walk 
up and then go across. No, no, a p pedestrian ramp is what's, what's sort of commonly known as the curb cut that uh, you would see those, at the corner. Uh, um, you know, now if you, hopefully if you come to most corners in New York City, you will see a ramp that slopes down. It's often got little, what we call truncated domes on it for the visually impaired and enables people in a wheelchair or people with a stroller or a cart to okay, go gonna, down into the yeah. street. So I, I'm talking about the one on the over the overpass. You, like so the one you mean, over the you mean like a pedestrian bridge or a pedestrian yeah. overpass? So those are pedestrian bridge. Yes. So uh, in downtown Flushing, I think we have a need for those bridges, you know. And, it's, and also on College Point Boulevard, like near Skyview, because there's so many people walking across the street, and the, the cars have a hard time to make a turn from uh, Roosevelt to College Point because people keep walking, keep walking. So that's the, my last request. You take, take a look because other cities have done it. They either build an uh, overpass or build a tunnel. Oh. So I have, I have been, uh, particularly in China, I have seen where they have them. One of the challenges we have here in the U.S. is pedestrian bridges need to be ADA accessible, which means that you either need to have a ramp that's big enough that it's at a slope that a wheelchair can use, or you have to build an elevator. And you know, thinking of the, the streets of Flushing, it would be impossible to, to do that. Hmm? Tunnel. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know Tunnels if we good. would get many people to go down so, into a tunnel. Usually people don't like them. It's only a, few, um, on a, a couple blocks and build a tunnel. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Councilman Chaka, followed by Councilman Rosenthal. Thank you to uh, Chair Gibson and Chair Rodriguez. Uh, and thank you, Commissioner, and your team for being here today. I want to start with uh, a conversation that I know we've been having uh, on the possible legislative side, but just a, a, uh, like a reconnection to the process that DOT takes to, um, and the dollars that are used specifically for cuts in the street for, separate from the million questions, from utilities that come in, or any other a plumber that comes in and essentially uses uh, l uh, lower grade materials and all of a sudden there's a pothole. And, and I think that that's, that's something that's coming from Sunset Park in a big way. And I wanted to, I wanted to ask to see if DOT actually an uh, continues to analyze the impacts of just subpar subcontractors and whether or not that's part of the budget conversations here. I mean, I, I, I look over at my budget. I don't know whether we've done sort of a fiscal impact of that. We have in recent years tightened up our rules and requirements, particularly for making people who cut into the streets do more to restore the concrete bed. And we have also tried to step up our inspections. But as, as I think I've conceded, this is an ongoing problem. It, you know, there are so many projects going on in the city and having, on any given day. And even sometimes if something is restored, it looks like it was restored well, and then lo and behold, a year later, perhaps it wasn't restored as well as it should have been. Um, you know, one thing we are, we are doing, you all worked with the administration in the next few years, we are gonna actually have some funding for trench restoration for places where there's been major settling in the streets due to you know, infrastructure issues underneath. So it's an issue we'll continue to tackle. And again, one where I'm hearing, I think from you and your colleagues, you know, perhaps there's some real council interest in you know, seeing if there's some things we can do better here. Awesome, thank you. Well, and we'll continue that. Just wanted to throw it out there. That's an important thing to look at because I think there, there's some dollars to be saved there and some efficiencies. Um, second, the, the BQX. Um, I didn't see anything in the, in the budget, but just kind of question for you. And, and we're, we're kind of still, um, putting our, our own committee together here, and we'll be launching that formally soon. But I wanted to kind of get a sense from you, I know EDC is kind of another driver of this, what kind of fiscal impacts the BQX has had on the budget for DOT today, staff, whatever whatever levels, and whether or not that's gonna show up in any of the budget uh, projections for for need for DOT. Right, and it's it's, it's, you know, so far the work that we, that, that DOT has done on the BQX, we've done with our in-house forces, basically. Um, we've, we've had our- Do you know what the costs of that have been on like staff time well, or- I, maybe we could put something together, but again, I think it's been pretty de minimis because it's sort of been for our, for our transit planners and experts, this has just been yet another assignment for them. So uh, maybe we can try and parse it out, but I, I don't think it would be 
a tremendously significant sum. I mean, it would be in the yeah, the, the tens of thousands, maybe. Um, maybe, I don't know, maybe, I don't know, maybe Elizabeth would say a little more than that, but, but not much more than that. Um, and look, obviously the bigger question looms. I know now you have a committee that will be looking at this, you know, sort of where is, where is the administration on the BQX? And look, the honest answer right now, and I've, I've said it before, is as we've dug deeper into the project, I think sort of two sets of questions have become pretty complex ones to answer, which is, how much work needs to be done with the infrastructure underneath? You know, the joke about streetcar projects is that they are actually infrastructure, you know, they are, they are subsurface infrastructure projects with a streetcar on top. So how, you know, the different routes we would look at, how much would we need to do in terms of water and sewer and utility relocation? And that is just proved to be an immensely complicated question. And then the second question, and look, I think some of the city's deliberations have floated out into the press is, the original premise of the BQX was this is a project that would pay for itself through you know, increased real estate values and some mechanism to, to capture those. And I think as we've undergone the financial analysis, I think the question has been, is that really true? And I don't know that we totally have an answer yet. And to the extent that it's not true, is this a project we would still want to pursue? Does it still have enough value? And is that the place, best place to put those dollars? So I'll admit, I think those deliberations have proved complicated. and not quite resolved, but obviously as your committee comes together, we'll, we'll probably be engaging with you in a more detailed way on that. Thank you for that and looking forward to that, that discussion so we can kind of think about this together. And would that be a request from the DOT, since we're in kind of budget mode right now, would that be a, a, a say we get to that point yep. and there's a gap? Oh, um, could we expect a DOT ask or is that an EDC ask? Just kind of curious about that. I think it's likely it would be perhaps a bit of a shared responsibility. I think this is a project that would potentially largely be EDC due to sort of their contracting abilities, because I think this is something that would require some unconventional contracting and, and oversight mechanism. But there's no doubt if we really pursue a big project like this, DOT would need to do some staffing up, I think, to you know engage in all the work that would have to be done on the streets. To be continued, and thank you so much. <laughs> to be continued. Uh, Commissioner, before calling our uh, council, I mean, uh, Rosenthal, how will the DOT be impacted by President Trump's uh, plan on infrastructure? Well, I mean, look, I have to say, first of all, obviously, which has been much in the news now, the enormous uh, fight that is breaking out over Gateway. I mean, that's obviously, it's not a, not a New York City DOT project, but just one that I think I would say from the city's point of view, it's so fundamental to our economic health. It's fundamental to the mobility of the Northeast Corridor. And, you know, it sounds now, unfortunately, if the president has, has turned against that project, that, that's very worrisome for us. Um, you know, in addition to that, there are the larger questions of formula funds. To date, Congress has not been inclined to make big changes in the regular highway and transit formula funds. Now that this big tax cut is passed, though, that may change, I'm not sure. And then there are also the discretionary grant programs, where traditionally New York City has done pretty well in terms of Tiger grants, and the MTA in the city have also done well in terms of transit grants. I think those those potential grants are very much in jeopardy, both because I think there'll be a desire to save money on those programs and because, you know, being a sanctuary city and perhaps not being particularly popular with the current administration, I, I don't know how well we'll compete. So, look, it's certainly, I think, worrisome what's, what's brewing in Washington, and I think, um, you know, the, the, the rippling effect that this big tax cut is going to have on the federal budget, we don't even know yet what the full implications of that are going to be, but I think they could be very severe, and it wouldn't just be transportation. It would be housing and health care and, you know, a whole bunch of different areas. Hmm? Uh, which specific project uh, well, are, I, have, are you doing at DOT? I mean, look, I, I think, again, it hasn't affected sort of our formula fund, so our day-to-day -day work continues, but, I mean, we would like to get some major, perhaps some major funds to help on the BQE, some major funds to help on it a Woodhaven Boulevard capital project. The MTA obviously would like funds for Second Avenue Subway and potentially other projects. I think those type of projects, 
you know, I'm, I'm very, I'm, I'm not optimistic that we're going to see, that we'll get federal grants for those in the near future, unless we okay. see a change in the political climate. Councilmember Rosenthal. Sure, thank you, Chair, and congratulations, uh, subcommittee chair, but awesome chair of the new subcommittee on contract, on capital. I really appreciate you leading the effort here, Vanessa. Um, so good to see you, Commissioner. It's been a long time. Um, I'm just going to jump in, I guess, after saying that it's wonderful to see three women up there testify. In honor of Women's Day, we, we arranged we it this way. Well done. Um, what are the barriers to implementing signal priority on more bus lines more quickly? So. I know this has been a big area of focus for the council, and I, I discussed it a bit in my testimony. And just, just to give a little background on it, I know you, you talked to, to Chairman Loda uh, about it this morning. And the, the history of TSP in, in the city is I think we have lagged behind other cities, and there, there's been a combination of reasons for that. For many years, the MTA was sort of equipping their buses more or less one by one. And then last year, the board was able to vote in a new contract for the MTA that will enable them to do it as a much more global software fix. And you heard, I think, Ronnie Hakem today said they would get them all done in the next few years. On, this, on the New York City DOT end, we're responsible for adjusting the signal timing. And I, I will admit that I think it has been a learning process for us because not only do you want to make the buses move, but you also want to make sure, remember, most of our bus routes, there's probably traffic coming in both sure. directions, and we have a lot of pedestrians. So our traffic engineers have wanted to take the time to make sure that we were getting all those things right. We acknowledge that we need to pick up the pace, and there's been a lot of numbers me, thrown around. Let me put it to you this yeah. way, because I have four more questions. Sure. Um, do you need to hire more? You've been through a learning curve, yeah. sounds like. Do you need more? Engineers, do you do you need? Are you, is it trouble retaining them? Just well, real, in right, under right. five I mean, seconds. I, I don't know that we need to hire more engineers. I think we need to do the process more efficiently, and we have pledged now to basically double, triple the rate at which we're doing okay. it. We're going so to you're get, benchmarking it. Yeah, we're we're we've pledged okay. now to get up Thank to you. a thousand intersections by 20. Thank you. Um, I understand DOT is under undertaking a pilot project to explore the best way to institute the protected intersections. And it may be the case that uh, where I live at 83rd and Amsterdam, uh, there's one actually there. I don't know if that's possible, but it feels like it, there's been a change and it forces the car not to go into the bike lane. What's the status of the pilot, and what are your plans for expansion if you think it's been a success? Well, we're, I think we're doing a couple pilot. We're doing one that's a left turning pilot where we're testing. This is the left. Okay, well, we're testing, I think we've done it at 110 intersections. Someone can double check that number for me. And so far, the results have been good. I mean, we've seen a reduction in speeds and preliminarily a reduction in crash data. We're still. It feels like it. It'd be, yes. It'd I be mean, nice to come back a year from now and see the numbers. It also looks like it's relatively cheap. To it do. is, you know, that's the good news. Cheap it is, is good. It is relatively cheap and relatively um, easy to do. I just want to jump in. Uh, is there, do you find, are you tracking change orders in your, uh, you know, with your bidding process? And are, have you found ways to rein in excessive yes, change orders I, when you spot them? Somewhere we have the change order numbers. Hang on, someone is going to hand them to me. Yes, okay. Um, we do track, and we are trying to reduce the number. So FY17, construction change orders took 62 days, design change orders 93 days. So still You know, if you have some good insights on that, I would love to meet with you to talk about it also with Chair Gibson because I'm sure there could be good learning across agencies on this. And here's an area where, um, I mean, I hear what you were responding to, but, but also the concern that the change order itself might be excessively priced or that there may be excessive change orders with particular bidders. You know, that sort of deep dive into what's going on here. Would, would love to do that, but would just love to flag there is a systemic issue. We have so many change orders. Again, not having design build. Design build does a tremendous amount to reduce change orders because you don't have the designer and the constructor right. pointing fingers at each other. Okay. So Short of happy being to do the that governor saying fix this. 
Um, I asked MTA earlier about the growing, about trying to grow the number of bidders so you can get more competitive bids, and you hit the mark talking about growing the number of bidders um, for the street marking companies. Are you doing that in any other areas, and is there anything the council could do to facilitate that? Yes, we, we, we try and do it in a bunch of different areas, and, and just a vignette, I think I've told the, the council before when we decided to do the procurement for the new ferry boats, which is a very kind of one-off procurement. The city only does it every 30, 40 years. We set out to talk to all the potential shipyards, and it was fascinating. And we called a bunch of shipyards around the country, and they basically said, we'll never do New York business with New York City again. You're suing us. The amount of paperwork and red tape and agony you put us through, go away. And we, we worked really closely with them to try and help walk them through the process. We try and do that in a bunch of different places, and we're particularly trying to do it with the MWBE community, where you know the city's bidding and procurement procedures are daunting. My two cents is to explore that further because MTA has the same situation where potential contractors say to them, the, it's too hard to get through the wall of uh, the ACOs who are just not gonna let other people bid. Uh, so there could be all sorts of reasons, sound like you learned. Yeah, I'm, I, I understand I mean, you're yeah. talking about something else, but perhaps there was something I mean, I don't, I don't understand the wall. I mean, I, I'll just tell you, speaking for my own agency, ACO, she's desperate to get more bidders. It lowers the price of our bids. I mean, she spends most of her day going around to industry forums to trying to encourage people to bid on our projects. So, so Joe Loda was saying this morning it's very difficult to get bidders. We're trying to explore it, the reasons why. Would Thank love you. to explore. There are many reasons. Great. Thank you. Councilmember Levin. Thank you very much, uh, Chairs. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. A um, couple of points I want to uh, uh, ask about, uh, and I'll, I'll keep it as brief as possible. Um, in light of um, you know, this horrific tragedy that we had uh, earlier this week in Park Slope um, uh, with the loss of these uh, two little children, um, um, there's been a lot of talk about uh, streets like 9th Street uh, in Park Slope and others where um, uh, we need to have, uh, I think, increased um, involvement between DOT and the community on, um, on traffic calming measures, both large and small. So my, my first question is, the proposal that uh, Transportation Alternatives has been talking about of doing these kind of lower impact uh, traffic calming measures, you know, f flexible bollards and reconfiguring travel lanes to make them smaller, reduce speeding, um, uh, things like that. Is that something that you're looking at and how are you approaching that from a budgetary perspective? Is that capital budget? Is that expense budget? How are you looking at that? I mean, that's the work we do every day. Those are the safety projects that we do every day. And, you know, as I've told this committee, I mean, we, we really, our work is really based, it's data driven. We look at where the highest crash corridors are. And I, you, you missed earlier testimony, we are going to do a major redesign on 9th Street. Mm -hmm. um, and look, I, I wish I could always predict perfectly everywhere where a terrible crash is gonna happen. The best we can do in terms of prediction is look where the crash data sends us and also what we hear from local communities. And as I said, we mm -hmm. try where we can to do the quick and easy things, which can sometimes just be pain, and, but in sometimes bigger interventions, and those can take more time, require more work, need to work with the, you know, the, the local businesses and the other curbside uses. Um, you know, this past year we did 114 major safety improvement projects, which is a record for us. And I think, you know, when I look at the declining fatality numbers in the city, not to, obviously we've had a terrible tragedy this week, not to say that we don't have a lot more work to do. I think by targeting where the crash data sends us, we, we've had a big impact. Do you have uh, the, the capital budget proposed in FY19 to do all of the interventions that you have identified and you and your team have identified at this point? I mean, yeah, most, I mean, I think most of the your work you're talking about is actually expense, is actually expense budget. And okay. I'm going to wait. I will Some have, of this have stuff like maybe uh, we'll, we'll uh, pull up. neck downs and that's not capital budget, that's expense budget. That's cap, neck downs are capital. Okay. Um, right. I, I, do, you, do you have enough allocated? I mean, do you, do you feel do like, my, yeah. I guess my question is, we do do are you constrained by cost at this point or constrained by budget or do you have 
basically enough that you, all the ones you've identified that you think are worth doing, um, you can go ahead, you have enough planners in your expense budget and, and, and enough design team and enough capital budget where it requires capital to go ahead and do all of that for FY19 or, or should we be looking collaboratively between, uh, between us at the council and, and you as an agency on, a, on enhancing your budget? I mean, really what I'm asking for is do you need more money? Well, I, I, I certainly think we would, you know, potentially, particularly in the out years, obviously engage with the council and with our own OMB on, on potential funding needs. I have to say, you know, thanks to the council and the mayor, we have had very robust funding for Vision Zero in these recent years. And to some degree, you know, not that we couldn't always use a little more, but funding has not really been our major limiting factor. I mean, you know, the limiting factor has been we're an agency of only so many people with so much bandwidth. There's only so many nights we can go before the community boards. There's only so much the whole city can sort of absorb in terms of disruption, et cetera. So, mm -hmm. I, you know, I, I stand by the fact that I think we've been pretty aggressive in our pace. Um, you know, if this is obviously a huge priority for the council that we staff up even further and, right. you know, particularly on the capital side, um, obviously let's, you know, we can engage in that discussion. Well, well, let's keep that conversation okay. going because, you know, every, every community that has, uh, you know, safety concerns, I mean, we should also be looking honestly from a practice perspective about whether we need to be going to the community board for every single action when, when, you know, major safety issues are involved, which, you know, it's an open question for me. I right. I mean, some of that is council mandated. So, I mean, if, if you all wanted to change the rules on some of that, that's, that's, that's within your discretion. I, I would just say that I think in general, working with the community boards has made our project stronger, has gotten buy-in, and mm -hmm. I think has actually helped us with the success we've had with Vision Zero. Sometimes, you know, even when we've gone to the community board, we've gone ahead with a project if we think the safety benefits are urgent. But in general, I think working with community boards has been a very positive experience for the city. Um, my other two questions were around design build at BQE and um, and uh, L train. Uh, you know, budgetary. You know, what allocated what's being allocated in FY19 to uh, L train uh, work. But I'll, I'll I'll follow up with you in the interest of time here. So thank you. Thank you, council member. I have a few questions. That my, uh, the, my councilwoman here has a few other questions, then we ought to go. One is on, on, on the pedestrian bowlers. As you know, we were able, we had the legislation that will mandate DOT to install a number of bowlers every year, but we were able to work with administration DOT with a plan where uh, there was a, an amount of, of for money funding invested for pedestrian bowlers. From that initiative uh, that we were able to come out together, like how many bowlers have been installed and what is this funding for the completion of that goal and where would those other bowlers will be installed besides Times Square? So so that the $50 million that, that we announced is a, is a DDC contract and my understanding, the, the latest is at the moment that they are working to get that registered with the comptroller and that there has been some some you know back and forth and questions about the details of that contract so uh, you know we'll fill, we, as soon as we can get more details we'll fill you in on the next steps but i think that contract is still working its way through through the city process okay that's important because as i say my goal is i think it was a good compromise on on when it comes to not moving on the legislation but for the administration uh, to work announcing those in that initiative. But, you know, our spirit is to see a aggressive plan of installing as many pedestrian bowlers in area that is very critical for pedestrians and cyclists. I always say that it doesn't make sense to me when you go to 42nd Street in the movie theater from 7 to 8th Avenue and not to see pedestrian bowlers when we know that there's pedestrian bowlers in front of Bank of America, but not in the other side of 42nd and 6th Avenue. So I saw that we will see more bowlers installed in our streets. Uh, when it comes to the street calming techniques, like how still I think that we share the concern that drivers get into crashes, especially when they make turn, most of them in the, in the left turn. Like with, in last year we were able to see a increase of funding uh, for Vision Zero Gray, Gray Street. Like where are we today and 
what are your goal for the next year and the next two years? How much funding do we still have? Should we ask more funding to be sure that under your leadership we see more street calming techniques, reducing the speed limit, especially when drivers make turns? Right, well, and, and look, I, I think I testified, and again, you know, thank you, but both of you chairs and, and council members for the great support you've given us on the funding for Vision Zero. I think it has been tremendously robust, and again, our capital budget for FY18 to 22 is 1.5 billion. Um, we have 270 million in expense, so, so we have a lot of robust funding here. Um, you know, happy to sit and talk with the council about are there priorities, you know, as we look ahead to the next few years, are there priorities you all are interested in that you think we're not getting to? I, I will just say, you know, as we're talking about capital delivery and, and some of those challenges, you know, there, there are the money components to it, but there are also all the other sort of process and outreach issues that go along with it. So, um, you know, again, happy to explore if there are key priorities you think we're not getting to, and you know if there are things we can do to either put more funding in or find ways to speed them up. The Vision Zero Educational Awareness Fund that we fought, we were able to get the administration working with the council. We put like a $5 million so that it, it, there would be some funding on putting the ad on the radio and TV uh, educating our New Yorkers to understand that the only way of how we will accomplish our goal of Vision Zero is by changing the culture. So where are we today uh, with that allocation? Uh, do, how effective has this funding been so that we can have some idea as we will continue conversation because in the 2019, one more time, those $5 million are not including the preliminary budget. Well, I think you know every year. Obviously, this is this has been a debate we've had, Mr. Chairman, and I think we we have always found a way as as the administration and the council negotiate the budget to find funds to do those campaigns. And I, I think they have been tremendously impactful. And it was great to do the one where we rolled out, I think, some great Vision Zero messages in several languages. And you know, to some degree, if there have been shor shortfalls, you know, our agency. Um, has helped put some resources on the table as well from our own internal resources, which you know we will continue to do as needed. Um, but that has always been one that, for our administration, I think has um, you know been a, a source of uh, negotiation. And how far have you been spending as a? What do you spend all day? I know it's not much. Yeah. I, like. Um, yeah. <laughs> why, don't, why don't you? Why, we'll let Elizabeth Mint talk about that. Um, yes, we, we spend it all when we get it. Um, we spent four and a half million last year, and we have three million this year from the mayor, and we're looking to reallocate internal resources. We put ads on television, on the radio, um, billboards, everything you see. Right. I, I don't want to see that in this area as, you know, a victory for the council, because those are, those are, those are like the type of funding that I hope that this administration, especially the leader on Vision Zero, understand that, you know, that funding should be in the agency. It shouldn't be something that the council should be here taking credit because we were able to get those funding to educate our New Yorkers, you know. And I hope that when the mayor come back to us with the budget, uh, that funding should be there, and I hope that it should be baseline so that DOT should be able to know this is something that we can plan every year. No, it's $5 million, but additional funding. Well, I, I think some of the City Hall team is here, so I'm sure they will they will bring that back to the mayor. We, will, we will as well. Thank you, thank you. So I just had a few more questions that I wanted to circle back on. So Council Member Rosenthal talked a little bit about uh, the change orders and change order process, and I have a little bit of knowledge formally working for a general contractor, and we approved a lot of change orders. So I wanted to understand uh, within each project that DOT has in its portfolio, do you project a certain cost for overruns and change orders that are already factored in? Like, is there anything that you do before um, you designate the total project cost that kind of takes into account that these types of things will happen through change orders? I mean, we do. We do okay. plan a contingency for our projects. But I will also say, I mean, I, I think you, you and, and Councilmember Rosenthal are right to focus on this area. It, it is one where 
uh, you know, I think we should brainstorm about how we can make the process better. Um, you know, again, there, the, the capital procurement and contracting process is a complicated one, and part of, I think, as a result of the way we do things is we do probably wind up with more change orders than we should, and, you know, I think we could probably come up with some ideas about how we could reduce both the cost of the change orders and the time it takes to process them. Okay, so how much do you actually plan for contingencies? Like, is that something that's factored into all of the work you do, or are there certain scenarios where it, that plays a role? You want to give an answer on that? I'll, I'll let Elizabeth take a crack at that one. Okay. Sure, I'll take a <laughs> crack at that. Um, well, one big step in our approval process is getting the CP from OMB, the certificate mm -hmm. to proceed. Yep. Um, I learned about that. <laughs> we generally get about 10% um, contingency in those CPs. Okay. So that's one thing that we get that is just, it's just one way that once, if there are change orders, we're able to proceed without a holdup of going back and getting another amended CP from OMB, um, okay. which takes a while. Right. Um, so, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. So if DOT was granted design build authority, um, how would, if any, would this impact your budgeting strategy for change orders moving forward? So I know design build would expedite it, but you would still have a period of time where a change order could potentially delay a particular project. Right, I mean, and look, I think even under, we wouldn't use design build for every project, and I'm not right. saying design build would achieve everything. would mitigate the need of every change order. I mean, sometimes we have change orders because, again, particularly when you do work in the city, when you go subsurface, when you're opening up a bridge that's 134 years old, mm -hmm. you will find, and, and other conditions in the city change, you will, you will find the need for change orders. But there is no question that a source of change orders in the design, bid, build, process is you have one person design and then they hand the design back to you and then you bid out the design to a completely separate firm. And the designer is not so responsible for the construction and the constructor is not so responsible for the design. And there's a lot of disconnects there and it definitely increases the number of change orders. So, you know, I, we can get you some of the industry data, but it, it I think it can be a real dramatic improvement, you know, reduction in the number right. of change orders when you combine the design and the build together. Okay, so in my opening, I talked a little bit about the budget line process, and this is certainly going to be a focus of the subcommittee with every agency moving forward um, during the budget process. About what would you suggest um, we could look at as possible measures of improvement that would allow the agency to retain your ability to keep your commitment rates up, that's important, um, but also at the same time while increasing transparency and really the council's ability to achieve oversight. Um, we talk a lot about it, so some of the general budget lines that we see are enormous in size, and it doesn't really delineate some of these specific projects that uh, DOT undertakes. So what would you suggest moving forward could be potential options that DOT would consider to really allow us to achieve both? I mean, look, we're, we're happy to explore ways to provide you with more detailed budget information if, if you all are interested. I, you know, until this year, I had never sort of heard that this was a concern of the councils. I think to discuss you know, what, what, what are the problems you want to focus on and the oversight role you want to play is a, is, is a conversation that should be very thoughtful. I mean, I, I've, I've said this before. I'm not sure that there's any government in the country that has as many layers of oversight as New York City does. <laughs> I mean, I'm overseen by a number of internal agencies, Department yes. of Investigations, Department of Justice, Federal Highways, Federal Transit. Um, I have my own internal auditors, so I mean, you know, I think, I understand that there are areas that the council wants to explore and we welcome that, but I think one also wants to ask, what are the things where you, you know, you are gonna perform a good useful function on oversight? Because I think part of the reason we're also so slowed up in our project delivery is the amount of reporting and oversight we have. Mm -hmm. It's astonishing. It's, you know, it, it takes reams of paper and armies of people to comply with all of it. And in that welter of information, 
you know, is good oversight occurring? Sometimes it is and sometimes maybe not. Right. So I think that's a really important question, but I think it's something that will take some time to explore and refine. Absolutely, sure. And all the more reason why the subcommittee was created. No, nope, looking um, forward to it. To give us more of an opportunity to keep talking. But I thank you so much for being here and for the work of your office on Vision Zero on so many levels. Um, and certainly during this budget process, we look forward to working with you and getting design build. <laughs> I have to put that last plug thank in. Thank you, thank Madam you. Chairman. <laughs> Chairwoman. To the end, and no member of the public will allow any form to speak, so. Excuse me? Yeah, but I. Okay. So, with that, Commissioner, thank you, and we will hear a member of the. Thank you all. Thanks. And now, good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Chairpersons Rodriguez and Gibson. My name is Barbara Blair. I'm the president of the Garment District Alliance, and I'm here this evening to urge you to support the request of DOT for funding of an approved permanent plaza in the Garment District. Thank you. The Garment District embraced the permanent plazas when they were created by DOT in 2009 for several reasons. The plazas addressed a desperate need for public space in the district. Over the last 20 years, we've seen tremendous growth in the number of jobs in the Garment District, the number of pedestrians on our avenues, and the construction of 37 hotels. The Garment District plazas on Broadway between 36th Street and 41st Street are the only public space in a 38 block area that's bursting at the seams with tenants and visitors alike. There is literally no place to sit before the establishment of these public spaces. Likewise, this corridor is a pedestrian connection between Times Square and Herald Square and should appropriately blend these Midtown West districts. Since the temporary plazas were created, we've noted some unintended negative consequences which need to be addressed. The narrow sidewalks in the garment district have created an unsafe condition as pedestrians are forced to walk in the traffic lanes due to lack of capacity on the sidewalks. The plazas are unlit at night and as a result we have homeless encampments during the warm months. Because the area is dark, the planters provide a sheltering type of environment and because late at night the plazas are not as populated as, for example, Times Square, they have become a magnet for the homeless. On warm nights, we can have between 50 and 60 homeless sleeping on the garment district plazas. We believe that illuminating the plazas will at the very least mitigate this problem. Also, when it rains, Broadway has severe ponding conditions that force pedestrians unsafely into traffic and intersections to avoid being ankle deep in water. Reconstruction, reconstructing Broadway with a permanent plaza will address and mitigate these infrastructure, infrastructure, safety, and social conditions. We understand from DOT that their request to fund the permanent plaza, which was approved in, 2016, in 2016, 
was not allocated in the first round of negotiations. This is a significant setback for the area and is of concern to our businesses and property owners. Over the last nine years, the Alliance has spent well over $4 million to activate, beautify, and maintain the plazas so as to integrate this neighborhood into the midtown cityscape. We did this in the good faith that with DOT and the city, there was a shared vision and commitment to create a dynamic public space that benefits the local con community, addresses congestion and safety issues, and improves the district for all New Yorkers and countless visitors around the world. I and the Board of Dir Directors of the Garment District Alliance urge you, the City Council, to support DOT's request and fund the Garment District's permanent plazas. I, I, I have to apologize. I realize this isn't a major bridge or tunnel. But it's very, very important to the district, and we've seen explosive growth. Thank you. And two things that I would say, I know that the council member that represent your district will have a comment or question, is that my, one of my suggestions is work with the council member to see how the Manhattan delegation can work on putting some funding, and yep. more than happy to support the colleague and, and you. the institution that you represent. The second thing is, we're doing Car Free Day, Saturday, April 21st. Yes, we're participating. Broadway will be closed exactly. uh, for that day, yes. So, but more than happy again to work with my colleague here to be sure that as you work with him through Manhattan delegation that we find a way of how to look at you as a priority to put funding in okay. this coming year. Yeah. Thank you, and thank I, you very I much, thank you Jeremy. for being here, and thank you for waiting thank through you, to testify. I, I wanted to know that if, if you could see my paper, the question I couldn't get to was actually about this and, uh, and, and asking the DOT. So I did ask the commissioner before she left to give us uh, an update on, on what was going on, and I note that my office will be following up to the recent letter with, that from OMB with yes. our own to continue to advocate, and I will work with the transportation chair. I appreciate his support at the delegation level to look for funding for this because I think that I share your, imagine, your, your sort of imagination for what the plaza could be if we actually mm -hmm. put more money into it and the safety concerns. So uh, I just want to offer my support. Um, I want, I will, will follow up with some additional questions uh, with my office. I, I know you've been working with staff have, and, and yes. we, we support it. Uh, I'm sorry I didn't get a chance to get to your question, but I, I thank you for being here. Um, what, can you just give me, just to, as a, from a, for a question here, I know that the, I think OMB has come back and not, can you just give us an update on where exactly? Well, so as we understood it, we, we were approved, we applied in 2015 and were approved in 2016 for a permanent plaza. And DOT requested the funding through OMB as part of their overall budget. And then we heard uh, from DOT that it was not, um, that it was rejected in the first round. But they did say that this is an ongoing uh, negotiation that will continue over the next month and that there might be an opportunity between now and April for that to be put back in. Right. So I was delighted to hear that DOT has such a robust budget. Yeah. And, um, but I'm, I'm hoping, I'm not exactly certain of what the process is now, but I was hoping you've been very supportive yeah. of us, Council Member. Mm -hmm. I know the Speaker Johnson ha, uh, is supporting this initiative. Gail Brewer, Manhattan Borough President, is supporting it. But it was our understanding that if we could get people to more vocally advocate for it, there's a possibility that it could be put back in. Thank you. Thank you for, for coming here and, and raising it to, to the committee. And, and um, uh, I will, I'll speak to the borough president about it as well. I think we're meeting on some, some projects tomorrow and we'll raise it as a concern and we'll follow up with a letter and, uh, and understand how this is a priority for the, for the folks uh, in, the garment, in the garment district. I've heard from a number of them. And I think I want to say thank you for your advocacy and, and for, for being here. Okay, and thank, thank you. you for your support. Yeah. And thank you both chairs for staying later. An old council member from Manhattan, <coughs> the leadership of power, that we will sign the letter to send it to the UT Commission. So let's work together. Thank you. Okay. With that, this hearing is adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.